Welcome to the Transformative Technologies and Energy Buildings and Transport Roundtable event. It is based on a book, as I'll explain in, in a moment. Uh, the idea for this really began, amazingly, six years ago. Uh, and that's because the center that we're presenting research from was initially proposed way back then. And the center was part of the Sussex Energy Group, and I'm presuming many of you have heard of the group, but I thought I would just give you a few opening slides about where we come from and, and what we do. We're at SPRU, so all of us are SPRUers, uh, which stands for the Science Policy Research Unit. It's more than 50 years old, and we basically look at innovation as well as transitions. And I think I just wanted to take a moment to reflect. I mean, I'm amazed when I talk to my children that many of the innovations that are so important to our lives today are not really that old. So if you think about televisions, jet airplanes, internal combustion cars, the microwave, the internet, mobile phones, they've all been invented only in the past 150 years. So when we think about future innovations, I mean, who knows what the next century could bring? And I think that's really what SPRU seeks to understand, which is the relationship between science, technology, and society, and the way that policy can shape those types of innovation dynamics. I'm lucky enough to direct the energy group at Sussex, which has also been around since the 70s in the OPEC crisis. We run a PhD program, we run a master's program, but what I like here in this slide is we really are interdisciplinary. I personally believe we are the biggest and maybe the best social science energy group in the UK um, and maybe in the world. Uh, and you can see here it's not just SPRU, but development studies, global studies, geography, law, politics, sociology, anthropology, ethnography, engineering, psychology, and the arts and humanities, the creative arts, media, film, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that that makes us unique and it means that we really do like talking about the social side of a lot of these innovations. As an energy group, you can see here, we do cover a really broad array of different things from transitions and innovation to finance to justice issues, whether they're distributive justice or procedural justice, to energy use, behavior, consumption, smart systems, smart homes, smart grids, smart buildings, smart transport, and energy supply, including shale gas, nuclear, wind, solar, et cetera. So I think SEG was ideally positioned to, to win the grant that founded the Center on Innovation and Energy Demand, which is behind a lot of what we're gonna talk about in the next hour and a half. And as you can see here, I would have to really acknowledge that CED is not just Sussex. It is also the University of Manchester, University of Oxford, um, which is why we have Debbie here from Oxford, uh, as well as some partners like Edinburgh, um, uh, who have also helped us out, and, and Strathclyde. What makes us unique are these three really colorful bubbles, squares, at the bottom, which is that we are interdisciplinary, drawing from all those disciplines I talked about before. We mix methods, so we do qualitative work, quantitative work, interviews, surveys, focus groups, et cetera, and lo and behold, we actually try to be relevant <laughs> for policy or for broader impact. The center, which terminates this month, ran for a glorious five years. And you can see here, as well as on some of the materials on your table, uh, we covered six broad domains, from transport and mobility, to non-domestic buildings, as, as well as residential buildings, to energy productivity and rebounds, to innovation and policy mixes, to industry such as steel, embedded emissions, as well as divestment, and energy justice, looking at things like vulnerability with smart meters, or exclusion, potential exclusion with automated vehicles. So with that out of the way, we're really here today to celebrate this final flagship output and in a really exciting list of speakers. And so you can see here is the book that the center produced, which literally came out a few weeks ago. So it is so hot off the press it could burn your fingers. Rutledge would say. It's called Transitions in Energy Efficiency and Demand, the Emergence, Diffusion, and Impact of Low Carbon Innovation. And we're extremely privileged to have the two editors of that book on the panel today. Debbie is going to go first uh, from the, and then Kirsten will go 
in the second panel. The book talks about innovations across transport, energy, policy, etc. So I suspect many of the themes will come out today. Just to explain who I am and what I do very, very briefly, and I won't take too long doing this. Um, so I essentially look after investment and advisory work um, across a number of different areas. Transport for London takes up a lot of my time at the moment. I work with a lot of early stage growth companies all the way through to sort of government, international level type consulting. The main areas essentially are energy, transport, property, with housing, and that's a key component of that, which I'll come back to, and also food. Food might be separate to today, so maybe we keep that one separate. Um, some of those, of course, are more policy-led than others. I mean, in food, there isn't too much policy around. It's mostly just great, innovative ideas that can make a difference and link with energy. Of course, with housing, transport, energy, there's a huge amount of policy-driven um, capabilities and strength and, and you know, learnings and challenges and whatever in the market. The role at Transport for London, simply put, is to look after energy delivery. So we're the largest energy user in London, one of the largest in the country. The big vision, the sort of grand plan of what we're trying to do, is to make everything that happens around infrastructure at TfL be far broader than just transport and to integrate all of it. So we have our sort of three eyes, infrastructure, innovation, and integration. And everything we do, and genuinely, because most people think public sector, does this ever really happen? Can it work? But you know, genuinely, I had a meeting yesterday with 14 different people at TfL, one hour workshop, brutally fast, across all parts of the business. Everyone's got to bring the most innovative idea to come up with our problem. That particular problem is how do we build a commercial rapid charge point hub, i.e. electric vehicle charging hub. But whatever we're looking at is putting that internally or externally and coming up with ideas. Infrastructure, of course, has to be far broader than just transport. So here's where a slide probably would help, but if you can imagine infrastructure for London sitting in the middle and out of that coming transport. All 17 modes of transport, which is always the great quiz question, if anyone can come up with 17, it's very challenging to get to all 17. You've got transport there. You've got housing. We're the most active housing developer in London. Most people don't know that. I didn't know that at all at the time. You've then got energy, biggest energy user, we've said that one. You've got smart cities and everything that goes with that. The full fibre network will be our tube network, so we're responsible for digital rollout across London. You've obviously got mixed use property development that goes with that and more. It's the most expensive advertising estate on the planet. How do we better utilise that? So there's the broad infrastructure and how do we take all that? But of course, infrastructure in itself, not particularly exciting. Most people don't really get too turned on by you know, buildings, energy, whatever it might be. The integration of those, of course, is where it becomes really exciting and the innovation that goes with that. So there's a division of Transport for London now that is called Innovation, capital I, and those guys seek to address the problems of London and they're gonna be putting out more and more challenges, many of which I'm sure will be relevant to you guys. And simply put, those challenges are, what's a problem in London? who can come up with an idea to fix it. So ideas going on at the moment, how can we better map London to look at energy savings? What about elderly people? How can we buy, provide a better provision, provide a provision of housing in London to suit the increased elderly population? Rapid charge point hubs, what do we go and do about that? All of these different things, and again, integrating them. So when we're looking at development, it isn't just housing. It's housing linked with energy and everything we're doing there to bring energy on site, obviously as low carbon as we possibly can to deliver that with digital, with mixed use development, creating a place, green space, blue space, all of that around London. It's absolutely fundamental to what we're trying to do. Provides challenges, but sort of therein lies the rub, and that's what we're sort of aiming to deliver at the moment. Well, thanks. I'm uh, Paul Appleby from BP. <coughs> BP, I'm sure, <coughs> needs no introduction, but we are a global transport fuels company to a large extent. It's actually, less than half of oil consumption is consumed in the transport sector, but it, it tends to be the more valuable part of the oil consumption. And, of course, our downstream marketing business is all about interacting with people who are travelling about in their, in their cars. So, it, topic very close to our hearts. Um, I'll give you a quick global overview of how we think about transport and then talk about technology. 
Transport accounts for something just under 30% of total energy demand. Um, that split roughly 80% of that is on land. Most of that is in road, about 2% maybe in rail. And then there's 10% roughly in the air and 10% on, on water in various forms. The fuel split, no surprise, I'm sure to most of you, most of that, 94, 95% is oil-based at the moment. And of course, the big question is, as we go through a transformation to a lower carbon world, what happens in this sector? When we think about technology, um, there are different le levels, if you like, of technology to consider. One is the vehicle itself, the thing that moves around. So the car, the train, the plane. Within the vehicle, you've got the drivetrain, the propulsion system, you've got a control system, uh, you've got various characteristics of aerody aerodynamics, weight, rolling resistance, all of those are important to the energy consumption then that can all be affected by technology. Moving the other way up from the vehicle, the vehicle operates within a system. So you can think about patterns of urbanization, how we move around to get to work, to get to educational centers, uh, to go shopping. Um, the, the modal split that's available, um, rail versus road, for example, and then the optimization or lack of within an overall system. Each of those elements, again, can be touched by technology. So there are many, many different points in which technology can affect the transport sector. The theme for today is transformative technology. So I'll just try and focus in on a few areas where we think really big changes in, in te technology could be coming. If I quickly go through the sectors, shipping, aviation, and road. <coughs> shipping, um, it's the smallest of the, of the sectors overall in terms of energy, energy use. It's probably the most complex in terms of finding pathways to lower carbon, lower to lower carbon use. There's a lot of room for improved efficiency. Estimates range from 20 to 70 <clears> percent. <throat> about half of that, <clears throat> excuse me, is ship design. About half of that is in the fleet management optimization of the system. Um, but the actual fuel use, well, there's all sorts of alternatives available to, to oil. It's, it's almost oil, oil today. You can electrify ships. You can have electric ships. On short routes, that works with batteries. Longer routes, you need something like hydrogen or ammonia providing the electricity. LNG, liquefied natural gas, can be a, a good bridge to a lower carbon fuel, but ultimately has to be moved out by something zero carbon. So all of that is possible. Um, one of the problems with shipping is that there's an existing efficiency gap, and it's not entirely clear how that's going to get closed uh, to do with the structure of the shipping industry, but it looks like you're going to need significant price and regulatory instruments to get any of that happening. Aviation, this is where the fastest growth is happening in, in transport fuels. Um, more limited options for decarbonisation here. Electric airplanes, people are looking at them. They, it's possible technically, but only for short flights. Um, electric air taxis, that's getting a bit of interest. But most of, most, for most air transportation, it's going to be some form of liquid fuel, um, either biofuels or um, some other zero carbon or low carbon liquid fuel. BP, for example, is invested in something called Fultrum, which is transforming municipal waste into jet aviation fuel. That's a big growth area, we think. So finally, but on to, to road. And this is where we see the really big transformative technologies coming at us. Uh, for cars, it's, well, it's two things. One is battery electric, uh, electrification of road transport. And the other big area, of course, is the application of AI and the possibility of autonomous self-driving cars. Uh, batteries, you'll be familiar with the issues there. It's all about cost and performance. Costs getting lower and lower all the time. Performance getting better and better. It's just a matter of time now before battery electric vehicles become competitive. In many, some cases, they already are with existing uh, vehicles. But there is still concerns around range and charging speed. And we can maybe talk about that in, in Q&A. That seems to be the big bottleneck, how fast you can charge your vehicle. Um, in the digital space, there's enormous amount going on, and probably 40% or more of the cost of a car now is the electronics. It's the digital stuff. It's not the, the mechanical stuff. Um, sensors, computing power, um, machine learning embedded in vehicles, which is now moving us towards the prospect of fully autonomous vehicles at some point in the future. There are degrees of autonomy, how much you can let the car do for itself. There'll be phased develop deployment, but at some point, 2020 onwards, 2030, we're gonna to start to see autonomous vehicles arriving, and that has big implications for the way that uh, transportation works. Um, part of the technological development is also just focusing on the, the driver. 
the biometrics you can apply now to drivers and just finding out how well people are, are as they drive along. Amazing uh, technology. So I'm a transport researcher and I sit in this uneasy um, place where I'm also a climate change researcher. And it leads to some embarrassing conversations with students and with rooms like this, where I have to admit that transport is known as the roadblock to climate change mitigation. That's not to say there aren't things happening, and we've heard about different technologies, different innovations, different ways of doing um, that potentially offer opportunities. Um, but to date, we're not seeing an awful lot of change happening in transport. And as a transport researcher, that's somewhat embarrassing. There's no historical precedent for the types of changes that we require. Um, in transport, we have seen fundamental change over time, but we haven't seen it in the speed and the scale that we're requiring at the moment. So transport must be part of any attempt uh, to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Efforts must be done, however, and I'm sure we will hear from our next panel, with more than climate in mind. So many of the solutions that we're hearing about at the moment um, have other consequences that we need to be thinking through as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those uh, over the next couple of moments. In his most recent writing, Frank Gills, who is one of the co-directors of the Centre of Innovation and Energy Demand, um, discusses whole system changes. And he says that we should be thinking beyond individual niches um, and starting to think about how things come together. So how we think about collections of niches, innovations occurring, new things that are happening, and how they might affect lots of different um, systems. And we've heard about the connection between the systems from the previous two speakers. It's really important. Hearing about housing and buildings is so exciting when you hear from Transport for London to know that they too are thinking how all of these things uh, connect together. But Frank also calls for this multi-source view of change that is perhaps incremental as much as it is uh, radical. So why am I talking about this? Because the field of transport is currently hugely preoccupied with three innovations. With electric vehicles, um, which are often viewed as one kind of innovation when actually there's an awful lot going on there and huge diversity in, in what they can do and their various infrastructures, which I should say I get very excited by infrastructure. I teach about infrastructure and I get really giddy about it. Um, so maybe I can tell you why I'm so excited about that later. Um, the second is automated vehicles, which again get spoken about as though they are one kind of innovation, but we already have automated vehicles to some degrees today. Um, and there are hugely diverging visions of what that future uh, might look like. And the third is practices of sharing, um, from sharing artifacts to sharing spaces. Innovations in electrification, automation and sharing need to be thought about together. They're undoubtedly related to each other and have implications for one another, but they shouldn't be conflated, as they are in many depictions and many visions that we see today. Assumptions about their contributions uh, to low carbon transitions are often based on poorly understood understandings of um, behavior, of social dynamics, of deeply held values and norms um, that are part of how we are mobile. This isn't to say that these behaviors and practices don't change. We've seen practices change. Benjamin spoke about some of the radical innovations, the things that we couldn't have forecast, and how much they have had implications for how we um, travel at the moment. But the jury is still out on whether these, these sorts of values, changes, practices um, are going to occur in the timeframes that we really need them to. Moreover, moreover, often the low carbon and energy demand reduction benefits of these innovations are based on other types of innovation. So when we talk about automated vehicles, uh, the benefits that we're hearing about demand that they are shared. Yet quite often we're not talking about whether people will be willing to share. We're not talking about ownership. The fact that we're gonna need people to not own these vehicles is a far bigger feat in my mind than the technological capability to make a vehicle autonomous. But we're not talking about that. We're only talking about the benefits that they might offer. So I'm going to talk about two things very briefly now before I um, hand the floor back to Benjamin. As I said before, we need to think about the unintended consequences of the technologies, the policies, and the practices. 
For example, the excellent work of Steve Sorrell has told us about the rebound mechanisms, the things that might happen in practices that we might not foresee, that we might not think about when we're designing technologies and policies. There's also questions of the spatial scale of innovation. We hear so much about electric vehicles, but what's happening to our internal combustion engine vehicles? Where are they going? If we're sending them to other countries, quite often we're sending them to less wealthy countries, we're just offshoring our emissions. Those emissions are still happening. So we need to think about what's happening with our current vehicle fleet before we get too excited about encouraging um, electric vehicle uptake. The second um, is from my own work and my work with Tim Schwannen uh, on vehicle uh, automation and experimentation in the UK. And it looked at Greenwich and Oxford and the types of experiments that are happening there. And from that research, I want to highlight the importance of the public and thinking about the public in its many diverse ways, that they're not just people that are going to receive these technologies, but they're a very important and diverse group of many types of people, um, and they need to be part of the experimentation process. And at the moment, the UK is patting itself on the back very often around these different types of experiments that are happening. But the public are not involved, um, and they are only seeing a very staged performance of these innovations. And I think that if we want them to be successful, if we think they are going to be part of our future, we need to be taking people along with us too. So in sum, decarbonising transport is of critical importance if we are going to meet any of the targets that we have set for ourselves as a country and if the Paris Agreement is going to be achieved. Thinking about innovation and low carbon measures as more than technologies, um, thinking across systems um, and beyond silos and accounting for the types of diversity that occurs um, is going to be of critical importance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Debbie, and thank you, Paul, and thank you, Alex. We have a few minutes for questions, so I think I'm happy to take them one at a time. Just tell us who you are, and then, of course, who your question is for. My question, hopefully, is slightly related to this conversation. I think um, it has a similar thread, um, focusing on transport and kind of this point Debbie was making around a, a technological focus and a focus on um, fungible solutions that can just be swapped into our current system of transport. Obviously, EVs are the kind of archetypal example of this. We don't have to change our transport practices. We just have electric vehicles. Um, and so, kind of, and perhaps it's that we find it easier to have those conversations with policymakers and industry because it feels less difficult than talking about modal shifts and um, even reduced demand for transport services. Um, Less travel, I think George Monbiot had an article in The Guardian yesterday about this, about kind of just reducing demand for aviation um, and how we do that. So I suppose my question is, because that's a harder conversation to have, and I think it relates to things around food and, you know, those more fundamental changes in how we are as a society, and we tend as technologists to kind of just shy away from those conversations because they're hard to have. How do we start to have those conversations and what form do they take? basically. So that's a bit of a one for the whole one. Technology changes the choices that are available to people, but the actual choices people make, are, there's a whole raft of other things that influence that. So yes, you need to get into a much broader conversation with people than just the, kind of the gadget, the technology, and not just with policymakers. And business. We, 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 there's a tendency for us to end up talking to ourselves in a kind of a, an echo chamber of business and policymakers about climate change and then but the actual choices and decisions made out there in the world by consumers you know we've got there's a gap between them. and um, we've talked a lot internally uh, in BP about you know, could we do more in terms of educating or helping people to understand the issues we, we put various things out is there, is there more we can do as an industry is there more that the wider can, community of people who are concerned about climate change can do to make the information more widely available and digestible so that people can actually make choices around using the technologies that are being provided. Um, where to go with it? So I think that whilst there are simple solutions, those simple solutions are always going to be prioritised. And that's why I think aviation is really interesting because there isn't a simple solution for aviation and there isn't going to be an electric vehicle for aviation. And so that, I was actually teaching about this yesterday and the master students were like, well, what do we do? 
well, people just need to fly less. Like that's, that's the answer. There's not really another answer to how you decarbonise air travel. Whereas at the moment we have these um, options for road transport that means we can become blinded by what actually needs to happen, which is that people need to travel differently and travel less and do all of those other things. But they are such hard conversations to have that we become so completely blinded by and focused on efficiencies and, and all of these, which may achieve some things. You know, electric vehicles undoubtedly are going to help us in terms of air pollution. Um, they probably or might end up being less safe um, in terms of noise and things like this. But, you know, it's, it's really tricky. And I don't actually, I wish I had an answer to that because I think that they are hard conversations and very often once you start saying things like that, they're so unpopular that you can disconnect from the people you're trying to talk to. And that's not productive. And I'll say that um, I'm not a huge fan of humans. <laughs> in that I don't think, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't see anyone making the correct choices in the coming period that are gonna save us from whatever we're heading towards. So that leaves you with two options, sticks and carrots. Again, in the world in which we live, democracy, we could debate it all day long, but we're unlikely to ever put anything in place that restricts people's travel, mm -hmm. that does anything like that. You can't see that happening, okay? There are, there are people talking about, you know, limitations of a, trips per year, or even when we try to stop people owning more property, and, you know, why does everyone own property in Cornwall that stops the local people owning property? You know, that has huge impact. It's very, very hard to stop it, which means ultimately you're talking bottom-up incentivization programs. To talk about EVs, Let's be very clear, EVs are not the solution. I mean, your sort of, your question is probing towards what a solution could be. EVs are part of it, but it is very dangerous if we all think, just have loads more EVs, because of course that doesn't alleviate congestion. It doesn't necessarily make anything safer. It should do, but it might not. One thing I think is key, and again, I'll speak from a TFL point as I'm sort of on the panel with that hat on. Um, we freed up data, a huge amount of TFL data, became open to the public a few years back. The savings we made financially went into hundreds of millions. But even parking that, the amount of applications that's allowed people to create that have had a positive impact on London have been huge, way bigger than anybody estimated. Ultimately, if you start with the data, that allows you to get the, ultimately the solutions that are needed. That's fine, but what does it mean practically? It needs people creating apps, you know, literally, if you, you know, someone probably got here today with City Mapper or something like that, you know, these apps are astonishing. They have a gigantic impact when you scale them up because they make traveling around London so much easier that we don't have to then all sit in a car. And the correlation between apps that have come in like City Mapper and people that maybe wouldn't have taken public transport before maybe elderly people or infirm people, that the thought of standing waiting for a bus for eight minutes in the freezing cold, that's not ideal. If you know there's a bus coming in one minute, 12 seconds, round that corner, you get on the bus, you can then look obviously and see when the train is, or actually the train's delayed, get off a bus stop earlier and take a different route. When everyone starts doing this, the impact is huge. That has a really huge impact. So it's EVs undoubtedly, and they'll go autonomous and whatever, we could talk about that. But I think the application of data as a kind of bottom-up incentivization program to get people using public transport will have a huge impact. Hi, I'm uh, Paula Kivima from um, Sussex Energy Group. You are actually already um, took the, your, with your comment, you took the discussion what, what I wanted to talk about and I was going to ask about how you see the connections between transport and communications. I'm doing uh, research at the moment on mobility as a service in Finland and I'm particularly interested on the kind of governance and policy aspects and what I've found quite exciting is how, for example, the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications, they don't divide transport and communications to different departments anymore. They actually didn't think about them in an integrated way and the departments are in a, around infrastructure and um, innovation and like you mentioned in Transport for London. But what I wonder that clearly um, digitalization has created a lot of opportunities for new business models and ways we um, move about. But I wondered what are, what, what do you think are the challenges 
of that uh, development from the perspective of environmental and social sustainability? Is it only positive or what are the possible kind of risks and uncertainties involved? And we've been fairly UK focused so far. And if you broaden it out to the rest of the world, over the next 20 years, we're going to see roughly a doubling in mobility demand. And most of that is going to be the developing world. So we'd have, be having a very different conversation if this was in Africa or, or India. Um, digital communication technology is going to help in some areas, um, but it's fairly marginal. I mean, it'll, it can reduce travel demand here in the UK, in the US, by a, a, a little bit amount, but it's not going to take away that potentially huge growth in personal mobility uh, in India, Africa, China, etc. And it'd be very hard to have a conversation with them saying, I'm sorry, you can't travel now. We, you know, we've used up all the atmosphere. Um, that, that's, where, that's where the real problem is going to be. Uh, I completely agree with that. So yesterday, um, we started talking about virtual mobilities at, uh, using Skype and, and um, other types of um, communication technologies rather than flying. And um, some of the students from Africa in my, in my class were like, no. Like that's just not going to be a response. Like that's not going to be a possibility, and it, that it's just such a UK sort of Western global North centric kind of idea of what is a possibility. Um, that's not to say there aren't innovations occurring in African cities that far surpass things that we have here, um, but that kind of idea of substitution. Um, might not uh, work in the same way. I also think that there are lots of issues, I sound so cynical and I don't mean to, but there are lots of issues with um, some of the ideas around mobility as a service where we have seen kind of replications of inequalities that already exist in our transport systems just being mirrored onto a new system. So when it comes to thinking more broadly about how our cities operate, um, I think that it Again, like EVs might have be part of the picture, but it's never, and there wasn't a suggestion it would be all of it. But, um, and then one last point is that maybe we need to think beyond cities sometimes and definitely beyond London, because London is its own context. And if we look at other cities around the UK, they operate very differently, um, even great cities like Bristol and Oxford. I remember I started working in sort of clean tech venture capital coming up for 20 years ago or so, whatever. Sounds horribly old, isn't it? Um, and I remember looking at some video conferencing technologies and everyone saying by 2000, you know, around that, like nobody will go to a meeting anymore mm. because why would you? Video conferencing is so good, whatever. And people said that and they've said that every few years. I'd love to know what percentage of meetings now are by video conference. I mean, 0, yeah. point 0 something. <laughs> I mean, I have friends that fly to Japan for a one hour meeting and fly home. I mean, how possibly mm. are they that important or... It, but is it the video conferencing's terrible? Is it just we haven't got a grip on it? Is it because we're too ignorant, arrogant, mm -hmm. whatever? I don't know, but it, it strikes me. I actually wrote video conferencing down to Donald's question earlier, but I didn't say it. But those technologies can play a huge part. I think this, your question is very valid. Comms have a huge role. And you probably know more about this than us. Like, I don't know why. And maybe it needs a step change, which is mm -hmm. like, are we talking holograms? Is it like minority report, you know, when you can drag stuff out the sky and... I mean, if we're all holograms, then why would we need to travel? Like, but we, we have holograms, so why has no one got a video conferencing app where you just get hologrammed into I believe the that there are... App that, that, you can do that, right. Yeah, it kind of exists now. So let's but, use that, and then no one needs to travel But it's different anymore. types of meetings, isn't it? Some meetings are about just sitting, you know, a, a, a Viva. There's no reason why a Viva shouldn't happen over Skype. But then, actually, it's the drinks after the Viva that, you know, the... So, so like an oral exam from a PhD student, it's the bit after it that the PhD student gets really excited about because they get to meet their examiners if it went well and have a beer with them. You know, so it's that part of it that's really hard to replicate. Next topic for research, how do people get drunk holographically <laughs> and then we've solved it? As many of you will not be surprised, I'm not really going to talk about technologies because I don't really do technologies, I do humans. Um, I liked it when Alex said I'm not a huge fan of humans. Uh, I know what he meant. Um, I once heard a very senior person from the International Energy Agency give a presentation that was entirely about technology saving the world. And I questioned the person afterwards and said, what about the human angle? And he just said, I, I don't trust humans because they don't do what you want them to. Um, so uh, I think 
we need to think about the people side of it if the transformation that we want is going to happen. And, I, you know, I reflected on our title today, Transformative Technologies, and I suppose the first question that came to my mind is, what exactly is the transformation that we want? Uh, we often tend to think about it in terms of a transformation to a low-carbon energy system and frame it exactly like that, which leads us to the wrong answer. Um, because it leads us to say, in buildings terms, we need to reduce energy demand. I've no problem with that as an idea. But for us to do that, the buildings that we produce at the end of the transformation have to be buildings that the people inside them, A, want, B, enjoy, and C, actually use in the way we kind of want them to use them rather than fighting the building, which often happens in a high-tech commercial building at the moment. Um, we need to think about how lower energy demand in buildings interacts with low carbon supply. How do we transform the two together? What are the systems? What is the sensible policy framework that lets the person in the building participate in this transition that we're trying to develop, whilst, to the extent possible, choosing the thing that they most want. Because unless we can do that, people won't do what we want them to do when we won't deliver the transition. What about delivering better energy services as well as a low carbon system at the same time? Um, better thermal comfort. We tend to start the discussion around a energy, high energy performance building from the idea that it delivers thermal comfort. And then we go and define that as a temperature in a living room and a different temperature around the rest of the house. Have you ever come across anybody who expresses being thermally comfortable as a temperature? It's about airflow, it's about feeling cosy, it's probably linked to the lighting in the room, it's linked to the ventilation in the room, it's linked to whether or not there's damp in the corner of the room. It's not about, is that room at 21 degrees C? But yet, when we try to design the transformed building, that's where we start from, which I think is wrong. Um, what about hassle-free entertainment? It's all very well having, I don't know, some kind of super energy efficient Netflix system, but if it actually doesn't come on when you want it to, you're going to hate it. Um, so we need to define all the elements of the service that we as human beings are looking for before we can transform the systems that deliver them. And I think we need to think innovatively about that. Not only how we define the services, but also how we communicate them to consumers and to people so that they drive the transition we're looking for rather than get dragged kicking and screaming. I've already talked about thermal comfort and it not being about temperature. Um, you know, what's more attractive to a householder? Lower energy bills or actually not having to faff with drafts and damp? We always talk about one and actually people care about the other. And, you know, you take that to its logical con conclusion, what on earth is the point of an energy performance certificate from a consumer's perspective? We don't tell people what's good about a high energy performance building. The next thing that I think we need to think about, and this has already been mentioned by Debbie, is how might the technical innovations that we're getting all excited about actually change our demands for energy services? Um, and if I think about homes, uh, it's, it, it's many different ways, but you know, sometimes a technical innovation will simply increase our demand for that service. Washing machines have not reduced the time we spend washing clothes, they've just meant we do it more. Um, microwaves and freezers as a combo have actually completely changed the way that we cook. We would cook very differently at home if we didn't have that combination of technologies. And thinking ahead, and again, this is what was mentioned in the transport section, what is Alexa going to do to the practices around shopping? I mean, it's not going to do it in my house because I wouldn't dream of having one of the things in there, but, you know, for a lot of people. Um, you know, I've heard somebody talking about his grandfather who's stuck at home and spends all his time shopping on Amazon 
for crap that he doesn't need because he's got a little machine that will do it really easily for him. So before we assume that an innovation is good, we really need to think about how we are going to use it. And that's where we don't trust humans, because we never know how we're going to use it, do we? Um, of course we're going to need innovation in technologies. There's easy examples to talk about around homes. We do need better, thinner, cheaper solid wall insulation. That's a no-brainer. We need that. Um, and it's interesting that the government's construction sector grand challenge frames that in terms of simply cheaper. We want to reduce the cost of delivering high energy performance buildings by 50%. I have no argument with that. I think that's a great, great challenge. But what about all the rest of the stuff I've just talked about? What about it being better as well as cheaper? Um, we also, I think, need to think about Rather than simply getting overexcited about the latest new thing, how do we combine the old with the new? How do we take an offering to the householder that really encourages them to do the really boring stuff that we already know how to do? The building, a lot of it is the building fabric stuff alongside having the WYSI control system on their heating system or the PV with the battery, all the stuff that really excites people. How do you present it in an innovative business model that gets people to do all of it rather than just the exciting stuff. We will have to do that if we're going to get our buildings as low carbon as we need them to be. Where do I think the biggest opportunity lies maybe in all this piece? I think, again, it's been mentioned already in the transport panel, data. Um, we define warmth as 21 degrees C because we don't know how to do it any better. And yet now we are getting such new sources of data that might help us do that, and I think we really need to use them. We often simply do not understand properly how the system, which is the building and the people in it, works. So we don't design the optimal systems to deliver that thermal comfort. We've got all this data coming from smart metering. Are we going to use it properly? Are we going to get access to it to use it properly? That would be quite nice. Um, <clears throat> and we do have, of course, we do have the computing power. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a guy called Nick Worth give a presentation on his computational fluid dynamics. He used to use it for designing Formula One race cars. He now uses it to look at energy use in buildings. And I am not that excited by technology normally, but his computer models are really whizzy. They're really quite fun. That sort of technology can help us to understand what's going on inside a building so much better. We just need to use it right. But we need to be careful about what we do with the data and how positive it is. Um, City Mapper. Alex mentioned City Mapper. I use it all the time. I think it's fantastic. And I agree that if it stops the old lady standing at the bus stop for 10 minutes with no bus, it's brilliant. But my daughter used to use it to figure out what time to leave the house to get the bus to school. Now, when I went to school, it was a completely stress-free experience. I was never quite sure when the bus was going to turn up, so I left plenty of time, walked out of the house, got on the bus, got to school. Every single morning we had the, oh, there's a bus five minutes away. Right, I better get my coat on. Oh, no, hang on, that bus has disappeared. Oh, no, no, hang on, there's the bus ten minutes away. Now, oh, my God, I'm going to be late. The level of stress around that journey was on another planet compared to what it had been when I was doing it. So we've got to get the data right, and we've got to get the way we present it to the user right. Um, I think that's enough from me. So, you know, to summarise... We need some technical innovation, but I think we need to innovate our approaches and our understanding more. We've got lots of tools that are going to help us develop this. I just think we need to make more and better use of them. Thank you. Okay, those who don't know me, uh, I'm Jeremy Vincent. I work at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And uh, in my day job, I work on consumer and social research policy. A lot of those things we talked about, social research. But today I was going to talk more about um, innovation and what government is doing on energy innovation. I often get asked, we need to transform the energy system. What is government doing? You're not doing enough. 
So I'm going to put a report and say we're doing quite a lot. We do, a, there's a lot on policy, there's a lot on regulation, there's a lot on data I could talk about, um, but this is about hard cash. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the government funding for energy innovation, why we fund it, on what, a few examples on the building side. I'm going to raise an issue about how we learn from the innovation we spent, how we monitor it's going well, what we get from it, it doesn't always work. Uh, and, and then a little bit about how we're planning for what next. What are we going to invest this money in? It's taxpayers' money. So firstly, the good news. Uh, the amount we're spending in this period, uh, 500 million on energy innovation. This isn't including the work that goes through Innovate UK or the research councils or anything else. This is just the innovation energy program. Uh, it aims to accelerate the commercialization of innovative, clean, reliable energy technologies in the 20s and 30, 2020s and 2030s. Uh, I don't know if you can see the detail, um, but we're looking at six themes. Uh, renew, where should we start? 180 million in nuclear, 15 million in renewables, 100 million in industrial decarbonisation, CCUS, 90 million in the built environment, that's the one I'm going to focus on, and 70 million on smart. Um, within those themes, the budget is uh, allocated to a mix of development and demonstration projects, underpinned by cross-cutting support, including finance. Um, and in the clean growth strategy, I'm sure you've all read the industrial strategy, the government says that this kind of volume of spend is important for the country because government is a facilitator. It believes it can drive down costs. Uh, its second objective is around laying the groundwork for future decisions. So some areas where the technology isn't there yet, heating pathways is one. The government can help in demonstration projects to lead towards decision making. And the third is uh, about the government's uh, vision around nurturing technologies and business and leveraging private investment. So there's quite a lot of leveraging that goes on the back of it. So talk, talk a bit about buildings. Uh, Simple picture of a house. Uh, 90 million on the, uh, the building side. Uh, just to give some examples of what that funds, many of you will know the Smart Systems and Heat program. Uh, we're putting 10 million into that in this program. Um, and that is really about uh, looking at the way to decarbonize domestic heat. A lot of that is focused on the consumer aspect, what people think about, what will they use, energy service models of the future, moving beyond bills. It takes time to test those things and they have an innovative lab. They've got all sorts of innovations there. So smart systems and heat, uh, some excellent work there. Uh, and another chunk, 25 million, is around hydrogen, and hydrogen as a potential source. So there's a lot of demonstration work in the uh, sort of technical side of things, and if that goes according to plan, we would look at more sort of residential testing. Um, there's also an awful lot on energy efficiency and uh, hot water, but I'll come to that if, if required later. So I wanted to say something about our cross-cutting fund, £50 million. Uh, we've been funding something called the Energy Entrepreneurs Fund for about six years. In this period, it's £50 million. And this is directed at small and medium-sized enterprises. It's a competitive grant scheme where they seek ideas. What are the best ideas from small businesses? on ways to uh, decarbonize and bring around low carbon energy. Um, the example here uh, is a Qbot. You may have heard of it or seen it. A lot of robots that are used to get into difficult places to assess buildings for assessment purposes. This one is layering uh, foam insulation under floorboards where it's quite difficult for people to get under uh, suspended timber. They've got quite a lot of different robotic uh, applications which uh, has come from that fund. So the argument I guess I'm making is we are funding a lot uh, and so what is the question? What about learning? Uh, the key message I guess is that uh, energy technology takes time. It's a bumpy road at times. Looking at the work from the centre you can see the valley of death and so forth. It can take a lot of time to realise commercial benefits um, and this schematic is really about the different stages from early research and development, pilot de demonstrations, fuller demonstrations in situ, and ultimately deployment. And from the government's perspective, we do quite a lot at this front end. 
often because there isn't a business profit incentive there at that time. And then moving forward, we will tend to scale back. So a lot of our work is around uh, R&D testing. Uh, and in the current portfolio, we've got uh, key performance indicators right across everything we fund so we can compare. Uh, and we insist on evaluations for all the larger funded projects and schemes. And a lot of that work is uh, designed by social scientists, including some in the room. So it isn't all the technology side, it's a message. Finally, uh, I get asked quite a lot, so how do you decide what to spend your money on? Or your money, the public's money on. Good question. Um, in the past, they had something you'll know, hopefully called TINAs, you might not. Technology Innovation Needs Assessment. Uh, and so basically that was an attempt to build the evidence base and to decide how to target that spend in the last period. We're iterating that to something called ENAS, uh, the Energy Innovation Needs Assessment. And basically we decided we want to be more thorough in thinking about exactly uh, how to make uh, our investments effective. So we've commissioned quite a lot of analysis to develop a methodology for us to use in this year to think about the next spending tranche in the spending review. So the idea is of this new system is to focus our innovation where it has greatest potential system benefits, uh, where it can benefit the economy through business opportunities, and where we are likely to benefit, uh, where the support is likely to be realized, essentially, if I don't trip up. So we've got, I would say, quite a lot of work and thinking done to make sure that we can target our funding and that we can learn from our funding. I think I'll end on that. So I'm Jim Watson. I'm director of the UK Energy Research Centre. I'm also at UCL here in London. I used to be at Sussex for a long time, so it's really nice to be back, and particularly nice to see the culmination of all the great work the team has done under the Centre for Innovation and Energy Demand. Um, I was reflecting on coming here the time when we were putting the bid together for CED um, uh, in the early stages. It was a two-stage process. And I remember some quite um, having to persuade certain colleagues who shall remain nameless um, that actually it was worth putting in a bid at all uh, to this on, at the first stage. I'm very glad uh, that we, in the end we agreed that it was a good idea because otherwise we wouldn't all be sitting here uh, thinking about uh, all the great work that had been done and debating what to do next. So I've got a few uh, thoughts on innovation and for buildings. I thought I'd say a little bit about where we've come from, because actually there's already been an awful lot of innovation, and that's actually helped us from a climate perspective, and also some consumers through their bills, to get to a slightly better place than they would have been otherwise. Um, a few words about innovation itself, how we might think about it. Um, probably echoes a lot of things already been said by other speakers. And a few examples, just to illustrate that, and a few thoughts to end, uh, particularly on the role of policy, which I agree with many others is, is absolutely crucial if we're going to make the progress we need to make. I mean, first on taking stock, um, if you look at what the Committee on Climate Change say, and this is purely from an emissions perspective, but also an energy demand perspective, we have got quite a long way on buildings. So if you go back to 1990, our baseline for emissions, I think we've reduced uh, emissions and energy demand from buildings by about 20% since then, perhaps a bit more. Um, so there's been some quite uh, large progress on that. And a key driver has been innovation and the adoption of energy efficient technologies, particularly quite low cost ones like loft insulation, new forms of lighting, uh, and those kind of things, and replacing lots of boilers with condensing boilers. So not particularly uh, radical innovations, but on a mass scale, they've made quite a big difference, both overall to the country, but also to individual homeowners. So their bills would have been higher, even though we're talking today about the rise of the price cap, because energy prices are once again going up. Actually, those bills will probably be much higher for, most, for many families had those uh, changes not being made. But I think, as others have said, there's a heck of a long way to go if we really want to realize the potential of innovation to help um, and also to bring those bills down in a way that's sustainable in the long term. Um, again, as the Committee on Climate Change has really emphasized, there's a massive policy gap at the moment in this area. I take what Jeremy said, you know, they're spending an awful lot on innovation, but when it comes to creating markets, giving incentives for people to do energy efficiency in homes in various different ways, there is a yawning policy hole at the moment, and it really needs to be addressed quite urgently. Um, 
because those incentives aren't there. And one illustration of that, if you look at the data on the number of energy efficient measures that are going into homes every year, it's probably about 10% of the level it was at its peak in 2012. So there's only 10% of the number of measures that are going into homes throughout the UK, as were the case in 2012. It doesn't mean to say we've run out of homes to insulate. There's many homes that you, we still have left to insulate. It's purely because the incentives are not as strong as they used to be. So when thinking about the future and thinking about where we go next, you know, what are some of the things that I think are important? And these, again, echo things that have already been said. I mean, one is not thinking about innovations one at a time, uh, but thinking about whole house or whole building approaches, combinations of technologies in systems. And I think that echoes some of the points from the transport panel. Uh, very much echo what Joe said and, and others about people and the social, uh, whether you're thinking about engaging with how people actually want to use energy, how they uh, perceive comfort, what matters to them, but also some segmentation. So echoing what was said, I think, by uh, Debbie earlier about you know, public's plural um, and thinking inside you know, the different income groups and different ways in which people will uh, engage with energy or transport and thinking about different incomes and means and so on. Um, one lesson from one of the projects we funded in Newkirk um, called Glider, which is led by uh, Gavin Killip at Oxford, is that um, actually one of the biggest barriers to change is the construction sector. So in a sense, some of the policy implications are not necessarily just about the energy part of the picture, it's actually about the construction sector. And at the moment, one of their key conclusions was if we're really going to unlock this potential, we need to move away from a, what they call a fit and forget approach. You go and do a measure and you go away to the whole house approach, to a more iterative approach to upgrading buildings, a more flexible approach, thinking about outcomes rather than models. Um, and that comes back to the points that others have made about data and how people actually use buildings rather than how a model imagines somebody to use a building. And I think my final framing point really is about supply and demand. So we think about demand, we think about the demand side technologies, but clearly if we're gonna decarbonize buildings, you can only go so far with making them energy efficient. We have to think about the fuels and the electricity we use to heat the home, to cool it perhaps in future, all the other services we use. And then that gets us into debates about large scale infrastructure change, just like it does with transport, um, thinking about hydrogen and other potential options for doing that. So onto some specific examples which have caught my eye recently that really illustrate some of these dilemmas and difficulties. I mean, one is, um, I, I was reading probably a few weeks ago about the first experiment with the Dutch uh, uh, idea called Energy Sprong. I don't know if you all saw it. It's the idea that you uh, use some very clever technology. Um, you um, scan uh, a set of buildings and then you go away and in a factory you build an extra skin for the building and you come and uh, install it and basically it improves the energy efficiency by a significant margin, reduces bills. The only slight problem with it is it comes with a price tag of about £85,000 a house uh, at the moment which is not necessarily going to make people rush to uh, B&Q and, and, and buy one of these. But it made me think, well, actually, if you think of it from an innovation perspective, energy sprung, it's been done a bit in the Netherlands and other countries. It's a very early stage of that sort of deployment phase uh, Jeremy was showing on the diagram. And actually what you need is probably quite a bit of public money as well as private money to get us through that process of learning and scaling up and cost reduction. And potentially we could see, you know, that kind of solution come in, I don't know, at the tenth of the cost in a few years' time if it goes well and, it's, um, and we have cumulative deployment and scaling up and the savings. The kind of thing we've seen in offshore wind, the kind of thing we've seen in uh, PV and in batteries, but applied on the demand side. So I thought that was kind of an interesting one, but the question is, well, will public policymakers and industry be brave enough to spend the money to see whether we can actually make those kind of cost reductions or not? The second is hydrogen. Um, it's been talked about a lot as the ideal solution for buildings in terms of making them zero carbon. Um, the idea is you don't disrupt anybody, so you keep the gas network. The consumer doesn't notice much difference because they can have a hydrogen boiler around the gas boiler. There's a slight problem with how, where the hydrogen comes from, but um, that doesn't get mentioned often enough. But we, you know, there are potentially solutions for that. But the problem with hydrogen is that we really haven't tried it on sc at scale yet. So we've got, a, got an imagined solution that people think will be great. We've got other solutions where people have tried them a lot, district heating, heat pumps, etc. Other com countries have, have really cracked those. Um, so I think before we can start getting carried away about hydrogen, we really need to do those large scale trials. Again, to, probably towards the right hand side of, of Jeremy's diagram. And again, that requires public money. The trouble is it's gonna come with a big price tag again. So you can see a theme coming out here. Um, but if we really wanna do innovation, 
it comes with you know, that price tag attached. Uh, the third one is a quite intriguing one, heat as a service. Um, people have mentioned services, and certainly since I started in research, we've been talking about the era when we're driven by services rather than supplying kilowatt hours or therms to people as being the, uh, the place we want to get to. Um, but we've been talking about it a lot and not really making much progress towards it, except in the commercial sector. So there's a heat as a service trial. Bristol Energy have just started, supported by the Energy Systems Catapult. And this idea that people will pay for a level of thermal comfort in their home, in their building, and that's a different business model. And ideally, that might then pull through an incentive for efficiency, to sell them low-carbon technologies, etc. I think it's intriguing. Who knows whether it will work? But I think one of the things which might determine whether it worked or not is whether it's really able to make that model work within the current market and regulatory framework, which still encourages most energy suppliers to do the pilot high, sell it as expensive as they can make it uh, sort of model. So kilowatt hours is what they deal in. And it, until that market uh, rules of the game change, I think it's very hard for companies to make money using a service model. So there's a question there. So what are the implications of this? Well, first, policy is crucial. That's a kind of obvious conclusion. I think if you're going to do innovation properly, you need to do all the things Jeremy's shown that government is doing. You need to do some of the ambitious industrial strategy fund, uh, challenge fund trials at a larger scale. You probably have to spend more money nearer to market. So government has an absolutely key role in creating markets, not just doing R&D. And if it doesn't do the market creation, particularly around buildings on energy efficiency, hydrogen, whatever it happens to be, the risk is a lot of these innovations won't happen at scale and you won't get those cost reductions. I think there's also a very, very important and thorny issue about inspection and monitoring and looking at the outcomes of efficiency in buildings and making sure they perform once you add the people and the way that we, in which they behave in practice. And that's something that we're very, very weak on in this country, and particularly even when we're building new homes, which are supposed to be much better than the ones we, uh, most of us live in right now. So I think standards and enforcement. And I think I'd just end by emphasizing that point about engaging people, not just as consumers, but as citizens because actually some of this stuff is going to require larger systemic change. I mean, it's great to see that Bayes is starting to do some public engagement work around different pathways to heat, for example. So I think that's important just to sensitize people to, well, actually it's not just a case of things happening in your home, but actually they may require upstream changes to the way in which energy gets from wherever it's uh, generated all the way to the home to, to heat it, cool it, or whatever. So engaging people in their full diversity, I think, as I think Debbie said, is really, really important really important too. I'll leave it there. Thank you. For those of you that haven't met me before, I'm Kirsten Jenkins, and I had the dubious honour of having my name at the front of that book that we've edited. Um, at my present role, I'm in the University of Brighton as a lecturer in human geography and sustainable development, but for my sins, I have also worked for SEED. Um, I was a research fellow there for a year and a half, uh, looking particularly at cross-cutting themes across all of the work that we were doing um, and in terms of my own focus on energy justice as an issue, which is something I want to talk about as we go through. What will I say about buildings in particular? Well, in the introduction of our book, um, we outlined that there are three kind of core challenges. Obviously, we have this overarching framework that about a quarter of UK emissions come from um, buildings. It's a massive issue. But we also know that we have really ambitious targets in terms of EPCs down to or above level C by 2035 or for fuel poor households by 2030. So there is a context in which things need to happen really, really rapidly. And what we say is that there's three different ways of approaching that. You need to look at transition losses or efficiency of the, that stage of the system in things like boilers. You need to look at passive storage, as in the house itself. How well can it retain the energy that's being used or pumped into it via radiators? But we also need to look at this fundamental issue of reducing demand. And I think that's a strong theme that's come out of everything that we've discussed, whether it be transport or buildings. And there are different ways of doing that, of course. You can ask someone simply to use less. Um, they can restrain themselves. You can say, OK, today I will be freezing cold instead of mildly tepid, which is the way that I live. Um, <laughs> or you can substitute it entirely and change the different infrastructure that you have within the house. And of course, that's also embedded within a system of supply where we need to be thinking about the energy that's coming in as much as how it's used at that stage. And I also wonder if there's something about how we're looking at our houses going forward. If we retrofit them now, to what goal, as we said earlier, what standard are we looking to achieve, and how will we continually adapt for the vision that we have going forward? 
And what I think we say in the book nicely as well is that there are different levels of ambition. We might talk about something being technologically radical, as in a smart meter. You might talk about it being socially radical. But what we're looking for is that patch of systematically radical, the way that we can jump and change the way that we live in a way that we haven't previously conceived of. And I'm going to come back to what I really think should be a famous rap song. Um, which would be the title, Homes Don't Use Energy, People Do. Anyone want to wrap that? <laughs> we were talking about contemporary dance earlier as a way to lighten the mood, but I'll save you. Um, but I do think there's an interesting notion there as well, that a house is something different from a home. I don't live in just a static material thing that costs an unfortunately large amount of money because of where I live. I live in something that I have made my own, that has my own notion of comfort. And you said earlier that people don't dictate uh, comfort by temperature. I do. 15 degrees or above, I'm struggling. So, you know, our own notion of what that house is and is for is a very, very personal and subjective thing. So whilst we're going to go through all of these hard policies or recommended policies around retrofit, we also need to consider, as we say, that people might do fundamentally weird things that completely bypass those systems. And in my case... I haven't shut my bedroom window all winter. And that, I know, is not an energy efficient thing, but it just makes me feel better. So, how do we get to that level of understanding? We position the book as one that looks at socio-technical transitions, and I think it's that socio bit that's really, really important. And in my own work, that socio bit takes the, the role of how do we engage people, how do we make sure that they are taken on a journey that for them is fair, is one that they understand and it comes down to this notion of justice. I always use her as an example, but I'd like to introduce my granny as a case in point, because she is A, a legend, and B, um, a very important case study of where these things can go wrong. So my granny, if you phone her, will take about 20 minutes to get to the phone. Uh, I've timed it, it's pretty bad. Um, but she's had blanket phone calls out the blue saying that in her old house, someone's gonna come in and fit a smart meter. And she'll ask them, what is a smart meter? And they say, oh, it's this wonderful thing, and it does this and this. She doesn't have the internet. So that level of understanding is a next level. And there's something wrong with the way that we're translating that information. I suggested that she might get an Alexa, and she didn't understand the concept that there might be a little black robot in the corner of the room that, OK, will usefully tell her the time, but also might tell her a joke. Like, it's just weird, OK? So we need to think about these way, the way that systems are being used and the people behind them. In terms of the opportunities and the threats to that, I'll refer you back to Donald's chapter again, where he says that the biggest uh, problem with these kind of challenges that we're facing is the idea of Medusa, that there are so many different heads, there are so many different facets. And really, if you want to slay Medusa in the context that he uses or in the hypothetical case that he uses, you need to tackle all of those in a systematic and creative way. So what is that systematic lens? I also think the opportunity is a fascinating thing. We've given a range of perspectives here on what you could do in terms of new innovations that are coming forward, uh, new funding models might be another one. But I think there's something wider in terms of how we as people live, and this comes back to your question earlier around, you know, how does food integrate into this? Where can we try and get people on board with the message that we need to live a different way? I teach... Uh, a lecture on theories of behavior change. And within that, I say that the blue planet effect is something really, really important. The blue planet effect is something I think quite tangible. It was that kind of consciousness in the UK where most people watch that program that we needed to do something about plastic waste. I can't say the word plastic. Posh. Um, <laughs> but is there such a thing where you could do that for houses? Is there a program that can reach a kind of level of societal consciousness where we realize that all of a sudden, we need to live in a different way. And I think that is the opportunity if we can reach those messages that goes beyond this book to translating them into practice. Thank you, Jeremy Nicholson, uh, attending in a personal capacity. Uh, and can I thank you that we did actually get on to technology with the second pa panel. Uh, the event is des described as transformative technologies in energy building and transport. And whilst uh, the human dimension is hugely important, I think it was a little technology light earlier on. Um, my question relates to a combination of rebound effects and energy efficiency. 
Um, some of you may have seen the recent analysis from Carbon Brief on the change in uh, UK emissions since 1990, which has been dramatic, something like a 38% reduction in CO2 emissions. Emissions peaked, I think, from the 1970s in this country. The single largest element of that reduction has been in energy use. Not all of that might be energy efficiency because there may be an element of carbon leakage in industry, but even in industry, most of that reduction has been due to efficiency. I don't know whether you share my optimism that that shows there's more we can do on that, or perhaps there's a pessimistic view we've done the easy stuff and what remains may have to be delivered by other means, possibly coercively. Um, but the difficulty for energy efficiency methods has always been rebound effects. And Joanna mentioned one, if you make it easier for people to wash ho clothes at home, they do more of it. Um, and it's the functional equivalent of comfort taking in cold homes. Equally, I would suggest that there are other examples where the direct rebound effects are no low to negligible, such as substitution of LED lighting, which really does seem to have produced a, a net effect. The academics here might say, well, what about economy-wide rebound effects? Mm. You know, it's not showing up in lighting or washing, but it's showing up in increased air travel. But the, the data, as I say, from, from carbon brief analysis shows absolute reductions in energy use. And I wonder, is this a fruitful area for, for academic study that perhaps after a certain level of technological development or prosperity, perhaps those absolute levels of energy reduction become uh, more possible and perhaps the technologies, whether it's LED lighting, energy sprung or anything else, might actually genuinely, uh, with or without policy support, deliver net uh, emissions and energy reductions. I think the short answer is yes, it is fruitful, and I don't think we've run out of road on these uh, trends. Um, but I would emphasise the policy fingerprint on that uh, trend is quite big, uh, particularly in the buildings area where you can trace back some of the reductions to the supplier obligations, to regulations on condensing boilers um, and other areas, and even some of the areas of industry. There's also a sort of slightly more negative, you might say, policy fingerprint in terms of overall strategy toward your economy and uh, the carbon leakage point that you mentioned. I mean, clearly, industrial restructuring has to be part of that story, and our own uh, analysis in UK bears that out. So it's not just deliberate policy to reduce demand or improve efficiency. But for me, there's more mileage in it. Yes, there are rebound effects. There's people in this room much better qualified than I am to uh, talk about the detail. But they're, they're very rarely what you call backfire, where you kind of get a worse position uh, than you started in. And actually, some of the rebound is actually really helpful, such as for people in fuel poverty. So actually, you want some rebounds there because you want those people to be more comfortable. And there's a lot more we need to do for, for that particular uh, subset of the population. So yeah, I mean, I think rebound effects uh, can maybe be reduced the less people know about things. So I'm really interested in things like uh, raising standards on boilers that has had a massive impact on, in these numbers. Uh, I would really like to see defaults change in things like thermostat settings, you know, with thermostats going in at 21 degrees. That, that bringing in a default where it's 20 and a half would make a massive difference. At the moment, we haven't got there, but I've been really interested in defaults as a way of getting around rebound effects. If people aren't aware, they might not notice smaller amounts. I think, obviously, I think, there is still huge potential. Um, I think the difference between what's happened to date and what needs to happen in future is that the efficiency gains in the past have been, I, can't, I kind of typify it as efficiency kind of quietly getting on with its thing in the background. You know, it's changing one appliance for a more efficient version or, or one kind of lighting for another kind of lighting. If we're going to go further and if we're going to be more mindful of rebound and accept it when it's positive and try and avoid it when it's not, um, we need people to be engaged in this. You know, it's great that efficiency can deliver exactly the same thing in a more efficient way. Why aren't we looking at delivering different things? And, and that's what I think the difference is between how the progress we've made so far and where we need to go next. I agree with all of the points, but there's quite a critical element that we've covered around the kind of the offshoring of some of those responsibilities, as you say, uh, the way that we've gone about restructuring our policy and what we invest in, particularly in the UK. So a lot of perhaps the savings that we've made have just been displaced. Tim Foxton from the University of Sussex, Sprue. Um, I wanted to come back to the, the idea that Jim raised, sort of one of his examples of the idea of the, the energy service business models, so selling services rather than, rather than kilowatt hours. Um, and, and, you know, does the panel think this is an idea whose time has now come? We've been talking about it for a long time. 
And if so, how do we, how do we you know, get over the remaining regulatory barriers and the way the, the energy market is, is currently um, uh, regulated around um, competition around price rather than um, uh, how do we get over that to, to promote the idea of, of, of selling services and a service business model? I have two minds. I think in some ways the time has come and things like the uh, amount of data available which has come up a few times is partly a driver and certainly if you look at what the catapult is doing it's partly a sort of data driven model so that you can um, you know sell smart services and all of that sort of thing. Uh, I mean as I said it, it's not unheard of in the more the commercial sector and if you look at large organizations those service models are actually how a lot of things operate partly because you've got much bigger budgets to play with um, and if organisations can link the ongoing energy spend with their investment budget, then there's a kind of service model to be built around that. I think one of the potential barriers, as well as the sort of overall incentive just to sell more units, which is still there for many uh, companies in the market, is um, just the longer time frame over which you'd have to have a relationship between a customer and a supplier or an energy agency or whatever. And that runs straight into some of the principles we have, which are very deeply held um, about competition and the ability of consumers to leave at 28 days' notice, if not sooner, um, a supplier if they don't like them. Now, in the era of the price cap, obviously, we're now in an era of more government intervention, and, and that's already been intervened with quite substantially. So perhaps that, again, is part of the shift which opens the space to that. If it's properly regulated, I think that's one of the prerequisites for me for having these service models is some ability, but with protections for people, to be able to have these longer term relationships. Um, you know, we do it over fixed term mortgages and things like that, so why not over energy contracts? Um, so I think that's something I'd, I'd pick out. Um, I mean, I just say, I hope so. Um, two things. One is the hopefully the evidence is getting there. It's been a concept for a long time, but we haven't had proper trials, which we now do, and the more of those can be scaled up, uh, the better. Uh, the trials uh, have shown that the consumers really like it on, on, on the whole. So I think that if that can be demonstrated as a market opportunity, I'm optimistic. Um, if its time has come, I don't know, but I would, this, the, the, rate, the diversity of suppliers available now compared to 10 years ago is huge. So I think there is a lot of differentiation in the market and there may be an opportunity for energy services there. I think like Jim, I'm in two minds over this. Um, I think there are two reasons why its time might have come. I kind of hope its time has come. Uh, the first reason why I think it might have been is because the, the system and the opportunities for consumers are becoming more complicated. So if you start looking at combining things like demand-side response with energy efficiency, it's much more difficult for the, the energy user to get their head round. So there's more of an opportunity for a service provider to say, I can do all this for you. And by the way, it's quite whizzy and you might earn some money out of it. Um, the second thing is some of the other trends that have been mentioned earlier around things like the sharing economy. And you know we've seen more of it in transport than anywhere else at the moment. But I suspect generationally, younger generations are kind of more used to the idea of having stuff as a service that we maybe are not used to having as a service, so why not? I think the two things that may potentially limit it, the first one is trust. You know, the energy sector still is one of the not so well trusted sectors. So if you're going to accept a new offering, who's it gonna come from and how are you gonna trust them? And we all need to work on building that. And then the second thing, Jim, is your point about competition and, and this fixation we've got with people being able to swap mm. at a minute's notice. Why is energy so special? Mm. If I want to lock myself into a contract for buying a car, I can do. For buying a house, I can do. Why, why can't I do it? Mm. And we do it on a fixed price energy mm. contract. There's a penalty. We know that we've got to stay there a year. What's the difference? I don't, I don't quite get why that's such a big, seems psychologically such a big mm. deal. Very quick question. Um, given how difficult retrofit is and all of those challenges, at what point should we perhaps be looking at demolishing existing stock and rebuilding? And what challenges might that bring? All right, fantastic question. But no one is smiling. <laughs> Kirsten. I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, that goes back to the house or home, right? So my, uh, where I grew up, 
I used to have to sleep in a snowsuit during winter, it was Baltic. Um, and it would make perfect common sense to knock that down. It doesn't fulfill what we need it to in terms of carbon emissions, but there's such an emotive part of what that stands for and for the community around it. And I don't think you'll get past that very easily. Even the most basic and leaky houses uh, will have had a history of family in them. So in theory, yes. In practice, no. If you'd let me knock down my leaky old Victorian house and build my dream house on the same place in the conservation area that I live in, I, I, might, I might do it if I've got enough money. Uh, but don't make me move from my community. Don't go, we're knocking this entire road down. Mm. You've got to shift. You know, we, we've, we've experienced of doing that and getting it really, really wrong in the past. But, you know, make it exciting for me and I might choose to do it. I think I'm with you, actually. I'd really like to be able to do that. Um, yeah, but we can't. Oh. Um, but the other point is that I think sometimes this argument's a bit binary. You know, either do something difficult with the building you've got or you knock it down and start again. It does remind me of the, the famous project called the 40% House that Brenda Boardman led a long time ago now, which, and that was one of its basic recommendations, is the turnover of housing is, is just too slow to get to where we want to go. But it does also remind me of some more recent work by members of her team, the Glider Project I mentioned earlier, um, really saying that construction, and it's probably something that you can only build in now rather than thinking about, I wish we'd built our buildings better in the past is to build the buildings we're building now is to make them more flexible and maintainable and reversible so that there is that you know so it gets us away from this oh it's just locked in and we either get rid of it or it's very difficult to retrofit so perhaps it's part of the innovation shift that we need to make is the kind of building we're building and how flexible it is for unforeseen things we might want to do in 40 years after we've built it uh, I don't know how easy that is I'm not an expert but it struck me as quite a, a useful way of thinking about how we might do things better now mm. uh, and get out of sitting here in 50 years' time having the same conversation. <laughs>